Hey everyone, thanks for joining. This video is a direct continuation of my previous video for preparing your environment to utilize event-based retention labels. In that video, we, pre we prepared our metadata to organize and tag our content for event retention. We also covered setting up our search schema so that Microsoft 365 processes could find the information when an event tied to the content was initiated. If you'd like to see that video, click on the links below in the comment section. Just in case you haven't had a chance to watch my previous video on preparing for event-based retention, I'll review the feature here. But I really suggest you check out that video as well. It has important information about preparing your environment. Okay, an event-based label lets you step outside the standard date-based retention and dive into situations that don't deal with create a date or modified date. In a document's life cycle, your retention trigger could be when an employee no longer works with the company. Perhaps you, co you contract with vendors and the trigger is based on contract expiry. Maybe your financial documents are based on your organization's fiscal year end. These situations can't be handled by standard created or modified dates. This is where event-based retention comes in. An event-based label allows you to customize how your content is triggered for the retention countdown. I won't say the possibilities are endless, but you certainly have a lot of options available to you. Obviously, an event-based retention label is more complex than your date-based retention label system. There is some preparation that has to be done to ensure your event labels function properly. This is because the event is based on queries run in the system. These queries use KQ, Microsoft's KQL or Keyword Query language to properly trigger the events for content. In order for your triggers to work, you need to have your metadata set up to allow the query to find your content and start your retention countdown. The previous video covered that, so please find the link for it in the comments below. But now let's dig into setting up an event label, triggering your content, and initiating an event within your environment. Before getting into the details of how to create event-based retention labels, I'd first like to provide an overview of the parts of event-based retention and how they all work together. First, let's talk about an event type. Think of an event type as a category for your events. For example, as you see on the screen, you should have the project lifecycle event. For me, a project lifecycle signifies when the project has completed. But an event type is also a container. The event type allows you to group similar retention labels together. This is because an event can encompass more than just a single document type. And each of those document types could have different retention periods. So when the event occurs, you want it to include all of the documents related to that event. In our example here, we have three different document types. But what if a project could have 15 different document types? If you didn't group them with an event type, you would have to initiate 15 events every time a project completed. You can have more than one event, such as the vendor expiry, and they can have their own labels as well as, as seen here. Again, this allows you to initiate events by group instead of each document type at a time. Now that we have event types covered, let's talk about the life cycle of content that is affiliated with an event. The process begins by having the admin, whether that is a system admin or a record manager, create event types and associate lab labels to those event types. Once the labels are created, they will either push the labels out to the pertinent locations or create auto-apply policies and have them attached to content automatically. Next, users will work with the content and where necessary, apply an event label to the content, unless it's done automatically. The user will also have to apply identifying metadata such as document type, status, or anything else that will help the system identify that this document is one it should apply the retention schedule to when the time is right. When the event occurs, the administrator will initiate the event, selecting the necessary event type and the applying the necessary query to find the data the record managers need to have retention started for. Please note, with certain situations, this can actually be initiated automatically without admin administrator intervention, but we'll cover that in a later presentation. Finally, the environment searches through all of the content based on the query submitted and will begin the retention schedule for the files found. Once this occurs, the label acts like any other retention label. The countdown is based on the schedule applied to the label itself, as there isn't anything in the event type that defines the timeline. Once the countdown is complete, 
the content is disposed of based on the settings of the label, whether that requires a review or just deletion of the data. Now that we have the overall process covered, let's take a look at an example. Let's go back to the event type of the project lifecycle. Within the event type, we have three labels, project requirements, project designs, and project change requests. Now let's add some content and tag them appropriately. Notice that we have content with three different projects, all with one of the three labels applied. But you'll also notice that we have assigned a project ID to each of these documents so we know which project they belong to. When project 335 completes, the project manager requests a closure of the project. Next, the records manager or an admin representative initiates the project closure event. When they initiate the event, they use a KQL or a keyword query language query to indicate the event is only for project ID 335. Once the event initiates, the system scans all of the content for labels that fall within the event type project lifecycle and initiates their disposition countdown based on the retention schedule assigned to the label. So that about covers the overall process of event-based retention. If you need clarification, please put them in the comments. Let's now move on to the actual process to build and initiate your event-based retention in Microsoft 365. We are going to start things off by creating a new event type within the Purview console. From the Purview homepage, click on Records Management, then the Events tab. Once in the Events tab, click on Manage Event Types. Click on Create. And provide a meaningful name. In this case, Project Lifecycle. And if necessary for your organization, a description. You can review the configuration and click Submit. And click Done after it's been created. You'll be taken back to the event type list and you can X out or click done. Next, we're going to create three retention labels, project requirements, project designs, project change requests. So click on file plan and create label. Provide the name and the description as required by our file plan and click next. You can enter your descriptor information here as you'd like. I'm going to skip this to save time, but I put a link here so that you can use it to go to my previous video on creating retention labels for more information. It includes the descriptor, descriptor information. You want to retain items for a specific length of time, so we'll keep the first item and click next. Here, you'd put the retention period based on your schedule. As this is just a quick demo, I'm going to keep it to one day. Because this is going to be a project lifecycle event label, I'm going to select project lifecycle event type trigger that we created earlier. Just a quick note, you don't have to add an event type through the event tab on the records management page like I did previously. You can also do it here if you wish. Click next after selecting project lifecycle. We aren't going to make this label a record in this example, so the first option is fine. You can just click Next through here unless you're creating records. Next, you need to determine what the label is going to do when the retention schedule is reached. For this example, we're going to start a disposition review. I'm going to only create a single stage and assign it to myself. To do this, Click on Create Stages and Assign Reviewers. You can create up to five stages, but as I said, we're just going to create a single stage for now. Click on Add a Stage. Provide the stage with a meaningful name like Final Review or Initial Review, depending on the situation. Click OK. Next, assign the reviewers. I'm assigning it to myself, but I strongly suggest you use a mail-enabled group in your own environment. Once added, click OK, then click Next. Review the settings, and if everything looks good, click Create Label. OK, we're back at the preview stage. To save time in this video, I went ahead and created all of my labels and pushed them to my site with retention label policy. 
Click on this link if you'd like to go into more detail of creating a retention label as I covered that previously. It'll also cover the retention label policy that I created in this case for this example. Let's jump over to the documents library in my site. You can see that I've already created some content. For this example, I have actually created more content than I need because I want to show you that a properly initiated event will only affect content you wish it to. So let's set all of the content up with the proper labels. We'll start with the change request documents. Next, the design docs. Finally, the requirement documents. Next step, we'll move on to actually initiating the event and we'll see how that works. If this is the first time initiating an event, we should make sure everything is prepared. To start, we're going to ensure our query is correct and, find, and it finds the expected data. Similarly, to when we set up our search schema in my previous video, we're going to test things out with a content search first. If you're building a repeatable process, this is something that you will not always have to do. You really are only to do, do this test the first time. Each time you initiate the event, you are just updating the query with the new value. So testing isn't always going to be necessary. So let's go back to Microsoft Purview and click on Content Search. Once on the Content Search page, click on New Search. Content Search isn't your normal search window as you can see. It is a feature of Microsoft 365 and is an artifact you create and can rerun as necessary. So let's give it a meaningful name and description. Since we are only going to be searching in SharePoint, we can toggle on that location. And to make the search even quicker, let's point it to the site that we're setting up for records management. We don't need to worry about anything for on-premises users. Earlier, I set the project ID as a managed property under refinable string 20. We are going to use that in our query. We're going to type in the KQL directly. This can be done in either the query editor or the KQL editor. The KQ, KQL editor has some type ahead functionality that could be useful in other situations. So select the editor of choice and type in the query refinable string 20 colon quotation PRJ335 quotation. Then we can review our settings and click submit. You will be brought back to the content search screen and notice your query is there. It should be in a state of running. Refresh the page periodically until it is set as completed. Once the search process is completed, you can click on it for the results. If you haven't granted your account the necessary reviewer status, you won't be able to see the results, but you will at least be able to see the number of items returned. If you don't have any results, or you have lots of results, then you likely need to refine your query. If, however, your query returned exactly what you were looking for, as it did in our case, then you know that things are set up correctly and we can move on to initiating the event. Now we're going to initiate the event for Project 335. To do that, we're going to go back to Records Management and this time click on the Events tab. Click on the Create button. Provide the event with a unique name and, if necessary, description. Click Next once this, once this is complete. Previously, I had discussed that all events are initiated for event types so that multiple labels could be included. But notice here that you actually have the option to initiate on a single label or even multiple labels. While the second option is totally viable, I still prefer to initiate my events by event type so you can ensure you get them all. So let's select the first option and then click on Choose Event Type. Finally, select the correct event and click Add. This next page allows you to enter the query you require to set the, and to set the date the event occurred. You can backdate the event but not future date it. Notice there are two sections for the query. The top one is for emails. You can't search for the same metadata as SharePoint, but you can search for keywords or email-based metadata like subject or sender. 
The second box is for SharePoint and OneDrive. This also affects Teams, but only because you scan the SharePoint site in behind. I want to pause here and ensure you are well aware of one very important bit of information. Never invoke an event without putting in any data query in the SharePoint section. If you do, every bit of content in your organization that has that label applied to it will have its retention schedule started, whether it's ready to go or not. Think of a blank query window as a select all. The query doesn't help you find the content, it helps you filter all the content. In the Exchange section, we'll put in Project 335. In the second box, we'll put in Refinable String 20, colon, quotation, PRJ 335, quotation. Click Next, review the settings, and then click Submit. You'll be back at the event page you can see our freshly created event. If we click on it, we'll get the details of the event and the number of files it has found. And this can take up to a week to populate. And that's the process for creating, using, and initiating events within Microsoft 365 Purview. As you can see, the prep for the process can be a bit heavy, but the feature itself is quite powerful and robust. One thing to keep in mind is that the initiating of events can be automated. It can be automated to a point that record managers or admins will only have to seldom need to be involved in the, direct, in the process directly. I plan on covering the automation process in the future soon. In the meantime, if you have any questions, hit me up in the comments. You can also check out my website for more information at prairiedeveloper.com to be notified when I release new videos. I invite you to subscribe to my channel as well. Thanks for watching and hope to see you next time.